Sans Pants Radio, Australia's most cowardly podcast network. This is News Fighters. Where we fight the news so you don't have to. With Dylan Behan. Yes, hello, fighters. Welcome to News Fighters for today, the 14th of August, 2021. News Fighters, helping you buy better. Presented by me, Dylan Behan, the Lionel Messi of wacky news clips. Coming up on today's show, my guest is Dominic Knight from The Chaser, here to talk about their great daily news comedy podcast, The Chaser Report. We thought if you're going to do a news podcast, make it daily. Mm. Go on, make it daily. And we didn't really figure out how much time that would take. Um, so it's become quite a beast. But first, to our main story. Zambians are set to go to the polls in what is seen as a crucial election for the future direction of the African nation. Yes, that's right. Finally on News Fighters tonight, we're doing a deep dive on the Zambia election. Will President Edgar Lingu receive a second term? <laughs> no, just kidding, of course. There's nothing else to talk about, so once again, I'm covering New South Wales's Delta Farce. Yes, we're in our seventh week of lockdown in Sydney now, and with the Olympics over, I guess for distraction, I'm finally going to have to bite the bullet and start watching reality TV. And uh, this promo for The Block actually really excited me. Monday, must-see bathroom week begins. Yes, coincidentally, bathroom week is also how I'll be spending my annual leave this year. Just kidding. I've never had annual leave in my life. Anyways, uh, I'm over this crap. I don't know about you. I'm just over it. I'm tired of COVID. I'm tired of the depressing news every day. Let's just just play the depressing montage of clips that shows how badly New South Wales stuffed up the Delta outbreak this week. Roll it. Gladys Berejiklian has effectively abandoned her target of zero COVID cases as the Delta strain spread to a record number of people today. This is clearly our third wave. Overnight, there were 390 new cases recorded. Less than half of today's cases were isolating while they were sick. What we are doing isn't working. It's going to be a rocky few months ahead for New South Wales. The Premier has revealed life won't start returning to normal until November. Fears lockdown conditions could extend till Christmas. The New South Wales government saying today the health system is under stress. It couldn't be worse. Not right now. Yes, with Australia basically in its third wave and COVID zero more or less abandoned, Australia has officially reversed Steve Bradbury, the pandemic. We were within sight of the finish line and we've tripped and fallen and let New Zealand win the race. New Zealand! Yes, and uh, here's New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian summing up where we're at. You're all gonna die! Sorry, wrong clip. Here it is. We now have to live with Delta in one way or another, uh, and that's pretty obvious. And with case numbers where they are, Unfortunately, if you live in those local government areas of concern, there is a high chance now that you could get the virus. Yes, good job, New South Wales. So in summary, you're all gonna get the virus. Thanks, Premier. It's all very depressing right now. I wish someone could just take me back to the beginning of this outbreak when all we cared about were those hilarious sunbakers who startled the deer. <laughs> Those were the good old days. Two men sunbaking nude on a beach on the south coast, apparently caught after they were startled by a deer. They were caught buck naked. Buck naked. That old one. I think the men were chased into the Royal National Park and got lost. Sparking a search by the SES paramedics and police helicopter. Each find a cheeky thousand dollars. <laughs> Certainly a story that raises more questions than answers. So anyways, back to today and things have been getting a bit out of control this week with Delta spreading Absolutely everywhere, even to places nobody wants to go. Well, Canberra's first local COVID case in over a year has sent the ACT into a seven-day lockdown. The ACT will enter into a seven-day lockdown uh, from 5pm tonight. We also have positive wastewater detections around the ACT. Yes, hard to believe they managed to detect COVID in the Canberra wastewater over all the weed and fireworks in there. Yes, and with lockdown now, people in Canberra are going to have to do absolutely nothing but at home for a change. Ugh. And I can say that because I lived in Canberra. Thankfully, there has been one upside. Scott Morrison has an election looming within a year, and he now can't travel the country he governs for the foreseeable future. Ah, what a shame. Now, COVID's also spreading into rural New South Wales, sending even more places into lockdown. An outbreak in Dubbo has seen the city go into a seven-day lockdown. Yes, I'm sorry. So, sorry, what? City of Dubbo? Have you even been to Dubbo? That's a little bit generous, don't you think? 
The lockdowns have even spread to the country music region of rural New South Wales, as if life wasn't depressing there enough already. Also under lockdown, Armidale and Tamworth. As a precaution, uh, the health experts have recommended that we lock down Tamworth for one week. Yes, now the men, women, children and dogs of Tamworth and Armidale are now hiding in their homes. And it's... Not just because Barnaby Joyce is in the area like usual. In fact, most of the population of New South Wales is now in lockdown. But, uh, you know, we, we like to roll our lockdowns out very, very slowly here. Like an art house film release or a life-saving vaccine. From Byron to Burke to Shell Harbour and the entirety of Greater Sydney and Hunter Valley, around 90% of the New South Wales population is now locked down. The local government areas of Walgut, Bogan, Burke, Brawarana, Canamble, Gilgandra, Narromine and Warren will all be under the stay-at-home orders. If you're having trouble keeping track of where in New South Wales is in lockdown, I recommend setting it to that I've been everywhere song. I've been everywhere. Been to Tullamore, Seymour, Lismore, Maloolaba. Walgut, Bogan, Burke, Brawarana, Canamble, Gilgandra, Narromine and Warren. I've been everywhere, man. So where did the virus originate from? Well, you won't be surprised to learn that, like all horrible things, it originated from Sydney. Almost all regional exposures during this outbreak can be linked to Sydney. An infected worker went to the Central West, a young man spreading the virus to Newcastle after going to a party nearby. That outbreak's led to exposures in Armidale and Tamworth. Another man's visit placing Byron Bay in lockdown. The spread intensifying calls for a ring of steel around the city. Police checkpoints on all major roads out. Yes, experts are saying a ring of steel could help stop the virus spreading out to our vulnerable and under-resourced rural communities. Uh, uh, what do you think of that idea, Premier? The Premier's rejecting calls for a ring of steel around Sydney. Unless you have literally a police officer outside every single household uh, in New South Wales or on every single road, uh, a ring of steel does not prevent Delta from seeping out. Yes, forgetting the fact that thanks to our obsession with tollways in this state, Sydney actually only does have like five main roads out of it. But anyways, yes, uh, Premier Berejiklian was firmly against a ring of steel for a very long time. But uh, on Friday night, actually announced a uh, uh, paper form of steel, a kind of paperwork permit of steel, if you will. It's expected also a permit system will be introduced for people who want to leave Sydney with police uh, checking drivers on major highways out of the city. Yes, like everything in this outbreak, New South Wales has finally adopted a reactive solution about six weeks too late and done slightly differently, so it doesn't appear like we copied what Victoria did last year. Good job. Hey, and uh, speaking of which, Gladys is also against a, another solution Melbourne had last year. But the Premier is refusing to order a ring of steel surrounding Sydney or a nighttime curfew. If we thought that they would have a significant or even marginal impact, of course we'd do those things. But there is no evidence to suggest that's the case. True, though, a curfew might help stop my dodgy neighbours from having people over every single night and the police not caring. I'm sure it could definitely have a marginal impact on stopping a COVID outbreak in my apartment block, which is feeling uh, pretty inevitable these days. Look, I don't want a curfew... Uh more than anyone, but I, but I reckon with these case numbers, New South Wales should probably be trying anything and everything that Victoria did, and more. And COVID isn't just taking over our regions, it's also taking over our regional delicacies. Tonight, thousands of KFC customers are ordered to isolate as staff test positive. A dozen staff at the KFC on Canterbury Road at Punch Bowl now have the virus. Anyone who visited the store at any time last week is now a close contact. Of course, the obvious problem with getting COVID-19 at a KFC is that if you start suffering from a fever, headache, chills and diarrhoea, you automatically just blame the KFC you ate. The KFC outbreak highlights that uh, much of the transmission happening in Sydney at the moment is in workplaces. In fact, uh, my local independent chicken shop near where I lived closed last Sunday due to a positive COVID case in a worker. And uh, as of Friday night when I'm recording this, it's still not listed on the New South Wales Health Exposure site list. So good job on the contact tracing there, guys. Really, really instilling confidence. Here's New South Wales Chief Health Officer Kerry Chant discussing how our workplaces are fueling the growth of this outbreak. This highlights, you have one person introduce it to a workplace. If you then have 12 people that become infected because we don't all maintain our social distancing. And then each of those 12 people will go back to their households. 
and introduce it into their households and then you'll get that cycle of household transmission. Yes, too many workplaces and businesses are open, fueling the outbreak, but uh, that's actually the priority from this government. Remember this. Why is Bunnings open? It's not open in Queensland. Next question. Why is Bunnings open? Yes, and some people are going to work when they're sick because they're not even aware that there's a $1,500 paid pandemic leave payment that they can access because the state government isn't telling them. Do contact tracers tell them that they are eligible for financial assistance while they quarantine for 14 days? Um, That's a good question. I'll have to double check that information. No News has confirmed that information is not regularly passed on. And while New South Wales has been standing firm for over a year now on uh, not paying people to test and isolate like Victoria did last year, looks like this could be about to change. News is that anyone from Monday who loses wages while waiting for a COVID test result will be eligible for a $320 payment. Now, this will only apply to those living in designated hot zones and the government is promising people will receive the money within two days. Yes, sadly, $120 less than what Victorians got last year and uh, it only applies to uh, the hotspot LGA. So, hey, if you live two blocks away from one of those, sorry, no money for you. So with our biggest problem being too many people are still allowed to go to work and many workplaces still allowed to operate at full capacity, the New South Wales government decided to blame rule breakers. Today, the Premier took aim at the people continuing to ignore the rules. Let's not pretend that people are doing the right thing. People are knowingly doing the wrong thing and pretending it's because they didn't understand. Delta does not leave any room for error. The Premier blames people breaking the stay-at-home order. We also have to accept that part of the challenge we have in New South Wales is because of lack of compliance. If people just applied the rules, if they complied with the rules and the law, and they applied an element of common sense and a modicum of decency to the rest of the community, we would be fine. If people just stuck with what they were asked to do, this uh, Delta virus would be finding itself uh, being beaten back into submission. Oh, and it's much more fun to blame a few bad individuals for doing the wrong thing when the actual problem is your deep-seated systemic addiction to individualism and big business. The New South Wales government is clearly consulting more business leaders than essential workers during this outbreak. And can I firstly thank industry for really stepping up. The stakeholders in business who've spoken to government about how we can get workers back to work, especially from those areas of high concern at the moment has been very positive and constructive. And can I please thank uh, all of business leaders, community leaders who've supported us in our efforts. Yes, the real heroes of this pandemic really were the business leaders and stakeholders. Remember when uh, in the early days of the pandemic, we all stood on our balconies and applauded the business leaders. Yes, thank you, business leaders, for trying to get as many of your workers back to work when it's clearly not safe to do so. Cheers. Oh, and case numbers got so high in Sydney this week that the government allowed even more people to go back to work. Thousands of Sydney tradies were back at work today after a COVID layoff that cost them three and a half weeks pay and the Sydney economy billions of dollars. Some still need vaccinations, but business leaders say even a partial return is a boost for everyone. Yes, an actual first in the in this pandemic here in Australia in allowing vaccinated workers uh, back to work first. So I assume that it's uh, all tradies working in these areas that have to be vaccinated, right? Oh, no, wrong. The Canterbury Bankstown mayor says unvaccinated construction workers from outside the hot zones can still work where they want. They could potentially bring the virus with them and vice versa. Oh, great. Well, I guess we know how COVID is spreading all around Sydney then. Good job. Yes, and as New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard says, this making sure everyone goes to work all the time is all about balance. As I said yesterday, We've tried to balance all the way along through this, uh, keeping our economy open, trying to address mental health. Yes, the New South Wales government cares about your mental health, except, of course, if you're grieving a lost loved one. The city's biggest cemetery closes its gates to stop rule breaking. Rookwood Cemetery, a heartbreaking example of Sydney's life and death struggle. Brad Hazard says, why can't they just go and grieve at a Bunnings like a normal person? Keep the flame alive for a loved one with a discounted tiki torch. So with case numbers in New South Wales still going up due to them locking down too late and refusing to institute a lockdown as hard as Victoria did last year, uh, the Premier's solution has turned from uh, getting cases down to vaccinating our way out. The Premier is banking on vaccinations to bring this crisis under control. The Premier claims we need more vaccinations, not tougher lockdown rules. 
With no end in sight to this outbreak, the Premier is warning the most challenging months are yet to come until the state reaches 70% double dose vaccination. And can I again issue a plea to say if you want to get back to work, if you want to get back to normal life, uh, please get vaccinated. Vaccination is key to what we can do potentially in September and October. This has been the experience overseas in provinces throughout Canada that a targeted vaccination program in those areas of concern has strong evidence of reducing the spread and allowing communities to live more freely. And that's why we're really appealing to people to consider their options. Oh, yes. Let's follow the Canadian example. I did a whole episode on this earlier in the year. Let me cast my mind back. Oh, now I recall. That's right. Ontario had 9,000 deaths and reached 4,000 cases a day during Toronto's like eight month lockdown, which saw inside dining in some restaurants closed for over a year and children's hospitals forced to admit adult patients into their ICUs, all because their similarly pro-business, pro-freedom premier Doug Ford refused to lock down early and hard and tried to vaccinate his way out. That's a great example for you to follow you absolute morons. And that was only with the alpha variant. You know, we're, we're trying to, as I mentioned yesterday, Rob, we're trying to have this happy balance. And it's, it's extremely hard. I've never been in favor of a curfew. And I'll, I'm gonna tell you the reason why I've never been in favor of a curfew. And that's, that's a hard, hard lockdown. Cars aren't driving around, nothing at all. Because I believe in the people of Ontario. And as soon as you tell the people of Ontario, you've lost trust and we're going to have police chasing you down the street when you're driving. That's it. It's game over. You might as well throw in the, the white flag. Please, please just follow the protocols. And much like Doug Ford in Ontario, instead of uh, taking responsibility for their own delays, errors, politically biased, bad decision making and a total lack of understanding of how everyday people live in the state. The New South Wales government is just blaming their own constituents. Good evening. Stupidity, arrogance and entitlement. That's what the health minister says is causing our COVID numbers to spike. You can't legislate against stupidity, arrogance and entitlement. Yes, that's right. You can't legislate against stupidity, arrogance and entitlement. But you can vote it out at the next state election. Okay, joining me now on News Fighters is one of the co-founders of The Chaser and co-host of The Chaser Report daily podcast. It's Dom Knight. How are you going, Dom? Good. How are you, Dylan? When I say good, good adjust that for the pandemic. So actually terribly, but good <laughs> relative to how I've been on other days during this lockdown. T tell me the idea behind it and when did it start? It's a daily news comedy podcast. <laughs> what insanity was this? But also good timing because there's a lot of news on, right? Mm. There's a lot of time. Yeah. Um. So last year we did a Chaser Report podcast, which is kind of an extension of the radio show that we've been doing, but was perfectly timed because we were all at home and um, couldn't get together. Yeah. So and that was weekly. That was a weekly that. show. Yeah, it was weekly. That was yeah, very manageable. Easy. That was it was luxurious, frankly, yes. like in hindsight, Dylan. <laughs> but then coming into this year, we just sort of thought, you know, they come out each week. By the time they've dropped, they're not even that topical anymore because we've had to edit them and whatever. Mm. We thought if you're going to do a news podcast, make it daily. Mm. Go on, make it daily. And we didn't really figure out how much time that would take. Um, so it's become quite a beast producing this thing um, daily. So you the, you took the weekly show and, you'll, and you're like, we want to do five times as much work. That was basically we the did. idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just been such a fun outlet for um, comment. I mean, firstly, the news cycle is so fast that it's exactly. the only yeah. way to, to, to deal with it. But also we've got this team of interns now Um who work for Charles primarily, who runs the Chaser Digital Business, but he's got all these um, young people who are really keen and bright-eyed like we all were 20 years ago. <laughs> and um, they are great, but they do a lot of the heavy lifting. They do a lot of the sketch production and editing and bits and pieces. So um, it's really good having them and they're really keen to come up with new ideas and so on. So it's not just me and Charles jadedly bitching about the uh, state of the world. That's about 80% of the podcast. And and tell me some more about the team. I know Gabby Bolt, who I've worked with on Irrational Fear, is on there. Who, who else Yeah, who else so is Gabby's, yep. Gabby's a massive um, star of, of the future. Um, we have uh, Lachlan Hodgson, who does a lot of the writing for the website. We've got um, Xander Savania, uh, who's been an audio whiz, and Alexa Vulovic. He's done some of the stunts. So there's an amazing stunt that he did where he infiltrated a sort of arms conference, like literally – a weapons yes. sales conference. It's all up on the Chase website to go and look at yes. the 
Uh, it's all up on the channel. So Facebook actually to go and look at the video, and he brought a bag full of like plastic arms. There which you go. Is such a dumb stunt. It's very reminiscent of our very cha- wouldn't be a chaser moments. stunt without some wacky props, would it? Wacky <laughs> props. That's right. Exactly it. So, but they're great because they want to go out and do all that kind of stuff. And um, the pandemic has made things very challenging in terms of audio production and just not being able to get in the same room, but we're just muddling through and still, we still haven't given up the daily podcasting dream just yet, Dylan. It's probably next week. And look, when I worked on tonight, Lee, and I love the catharsis of making daily comedy. Are you loving that as well? Like something, ScoMo says something and you can poke fun at it straight away before it gets old. Like surely you must enjoy that side of it, doing it daily. Well, yeah, it's like, I mean, we really like doing the daily radio show that we did. And I've done a lot of um, daily radio, just sort of solo with more serious bent. It is great because you need to have that immediacy or it's mm. just old news. Like, mm. And so I think that's the big advantage of doing things daily. Mm. Ironically, most of the daily podcasts actually take a bit of a deep dive. So when you first listen to like the New York Times, the Daily yep. or 7am or something, you think, wow, okay, this is a great way to find out about today's news. But it's not that at all. It's actually a more considered reflection of what's going on and looking at what it all means and so on. We don't do any of that. Great. We just jump on the news bombs as they explode. And yeah, and you do a lot of great interviews. Uh, who who are some of the people you interview on a regular basis? And and you're well, trying to do more poli- political interviews. I saw you had the deputy premier of Queensland on the other day as well. That was bizarre, Dylan. A man yeah. who actually runs a state <laughs> had made half an hour or whatever it was to come and talk to us. That was um really lovely of, of Stephen Miles actually, and he's a funny guy, so it worked quite well. But yeah, I mean. As with things like The Daily Show, we found that a great way to pad out the podcast is to include interviews. But No comment, no great. comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's also <laughs> great fun because um, it means you can uh, um, get other perspectives. So Sammy yep. Shah comes on our show every he's great. week. He yep. is also on Rational Fear um, and many other things too. But he's great because he gives you that Melbourne perspective and also yep. the, the, the ha-ha sucked in Sydney angle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right, which we desperately need. And his comedy brain works differently from, from ours and he's just so brilliant and amazing. So we just tend to sit back and just listen to what he has to say and he's always got some brilliant take on everything. So it is nice having more voices in it. And were we not daily, you simply couldn't do that. There wouldn't be enough time and space to let people kind of do their thing. And so that's the other plus of it being daily. Mm. There's a whole bunch of people. I mean, Gabby's a perfect case in point. She is so brilliant, but I don't know, we wouldn't be able to use it nearly as much if it was uh, just a weekly kind of get-together. It was the same thing on Tonightly. We had half an hour to fill every day. So if Greg Larson wants to roll around in oil, go for it. We've got the time. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what- we haven't managed to get Greg Larson rolling around in some <laughs> substance yet. But um, <laughs> look, maybe what we'll do is try and get a whole b- barrel full of AstraZeneca and yes. just see what we can do to get him roll around in that and, and try and defeat vaccine hesitancy, although it might backfire. And how, how do you have the energy to do it every day? Because I did a week of daily pilots of news fighters a couple of years ago, and I was exhausted for weeks afterwards. How are you doing this week in and well, week out? Are you taking a week off every every month or so, or how are you doing it? No, no, we haven't taken a break yet. Charles took two weeks off, but Danny Litch jumped in, so um, we kept the daily machine going. Look, there's a combination of things. First is I do have a bit of time to do this. Um, it, it probably takes up about half my day each day at the moment. But we aren't nearly as thorough as you, Dylan. We don't um, rigorously <laughs> assemble clips and do research and, and get all that sort of stuff. So if you're just talking about what's happened, um, we do occasionally put clips in. But uh, if you're not trying to be kind of comprehensive, if you're just picking a few topics randomly, and sometimes it'll, sometimes it'll just be like we're about to do our outro and I'll notice a story saying that um, the two founders of Hillsong have got a special exemption to go and preach in Mexico. Yes, I and saw And you kind that, of think, yeah. oh, God, let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> so it's quite spontaneous. Despite being a podcast, doing the volume that we do, you just got to take a run at things sometimes, and that's sometimes some of the stuff that works best. Uh, and there's been a no, no shortage of material lately, a lot of um, insane stuff happening, but have you got a backup plan in case there's a, a massacre <laughs> or a really depressing day of news or an earthquake or something? Like, what are you going to do then? <laughs> well, one of the nice things is that because um, – we did this radio show. We came up with various segments. So there's great, there's great. some things that we do that do not re- rely particularly on topicality. So Welcome to the Future, which is where Charles looks at um, ridiculous Bluetooth devices. That's kind of evergreen. <laughs> Craig comes up with flawless solutions to things like climate change, which are just ongoing things. So it's not necessarily all in the news cycle. And you can kind of tell from how many segments that we have like that in the mix, how hard we've been keen to work on any given day. But to be honest, there's been so much happening with COVID and the ongoing kind of omni-shambles of mm. the government's response. And 
being in lockdown in Sydney and just the frustration with that, we've been not at all short for material. I actually would like Dylan to have <laughs> some quieter news days and having the problem of working out what to f- to do to fill the podcast because it's just been nuts since we started this thing in late May. Well, look, it's, you know, it's dark times and it's exactly what Australia needs right now. And, uh, and, and is it weird? No one else around the world has, has tried to do this. Cause when I was, I was thinking of doing a daily show, there was no one else. I think other people have tried it and given up cause it's just too hard. Does that worry well, you? Daily, there are daily comedy podcasts. Yeah. Um, but they're Matt all pre-recorded. Do one. Oh yeah. Matt and then, Alex. Yep. 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 They're not as, yeah, so Matt and Alex, I think, get together every day, and I'm not entirely sure. It's less news-driven uh, mm. than ours. And that's the thing. Being news-driven is you're really creating a rod for your own back. But mm. so mm. far, we absolutely love it, and it's been one of the most fun projects you can do. And uh, the one lazy thing we did do was on Monday, we just did a like, half-hour-long interview with Sarah Kendall, a comedian from the UK, about Freedom Day over there. So we might do a bit more of that as the year rolls along. But to be honest... Being able to talk about the news every day is such an incredible privilege and there's so much to cover that, um, yeah, I think we're just getting started. Best of luck. It's an incredible feat to pull this off. I hope you managed to do it without all burning out like <laughs> we all did on Tonightly multiple times. Well, uh, to be honest, we did have grand plans to do things with video as we talked to you about before because <laughs> um, you're an expert at that kind of stuff. Uh, Too hard basket. Tr- <laughs> we haven't even bothered trying to solve that challenge yet. So, I mean, I've just been looking at Joe Rogan, who manages to do these like three hour long interviews mm. many, many days of the week, and just thinking, gosh, you know, it'd be nice to be able to produce daily video. That's the next big hurdle. We may or may not be stupid enough to try and undertake at some point. Uh, and what about t- TV stuff? Do you miss the the Chaser TV stuff? Surely this is this is a lot easier because you can do it from home and don't have to uh, don't have to dress up. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, I was behind the scenes mostly in the Chaser TV show, so that's a lot easier. But um, yeah, I miss the days of having an idea and getting a stupid prop commissioned overnight and going and <laughs> taking it out into the street. But we're all in our mid to late forties now, Dylan. I, I think there comes a point. Yeah, where jo- John Howard to- would outrun us. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually true. I think there comes a point where you've got to let the younger generation take over. And we have these, um, I mean, we call them interns, but they're really just younger versions of us. And uh, I think there's a lot of potential for them to go and annoy a lot of people, particularly if there's an election coming up at the mm. beginning of next year. And is that the rumour? I, I was hearing I was hearing late this year, but I think uh, I think Scott Morrison, stuffed up. Would you, would you go to the polls now? Actually, given his um, track record of decision making, you probably would. Probably would. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. All right, thanks again, Dom. And where can people find the show? Just put the Chaser Report into your uh, podcast app of choice or go to chaser.com.au slash podcast. Brilliant. All right, thanks for that, Dom. Catch you around. Thanks, mate. All right, that's News Fighters for today, whatever day it is, August 2021, News Fighters. Oh, thanks for Dom for being on the show. Check out the Chaser Report podcast. It's really good. It's kind of what I wanted News Fighters to be, but I couldn't get any funding. News Fighters is written, presented, and produced by me, Dylan Bain. I make news comedy. Someone pay me to do it. Uh, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, patreon.com slash news fighters. Give me money. Buy me a coffee.com slash news fighters. Uh, we don't advertise on Facebook, they're evil, so sign up for our newsletter at newsfighters.com. Uh, get vaccinated, wear a mask. Oh, we're on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram, you know the deal. Uh, give me money. All right, see you later. Bye. This is News Fighters, where we fight the news so you don't have to. You can't legislate against stupidity.